Today is the third Sunday of Advent, and our focus for the week is on joy, and the joy that the Christ child would bring. Please join me in this week's reading, and say the words for the response. Sing, shout, dance, rejoice, and exult with all your heart. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say, rejoice. We rejoice in the expectation. We rejoice in the waiting. We will sing and dance through the night because jo- because joy comes in the morning. With joy, we can draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy, we can find strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. With joy, we can move our bodies and our minds towards thanksgiving. We rejoice in the expectation. We rejoice in the waiting. We will sing and dance through the night because joy comes in the morning. Restore to us, O God, the joy of life with you. Remind us that joy is indeed our strength and that your joy sustains us. And now we light two purple candles and the pink candle. We light a candle of joy today, believing in the promises of God. The morning comes soon, and we will call upon God's name, and we will make praise be known among the nations. Amen. Good morning, Quinn family, and a special welcome to all of our virtual family and friends around the world. Welcome to Quinn Chapel AME Church, where our theme for this conference here is Soaring in the Kingdom Excellence. This is Royal Kami and bringing you the morning announcements. Today is the third of Sunday, Advent, where our focus is on the joy that Jesus brings to the world. A very special welcome to our guest speaker this morning, Elder Mark Ling. We stretch our virtual hands toward you and say, preach, preacher, preach. Happy birthday and happy anniversary to everyone celebrating this week. This is a new season of rest and renovation. May you experience all the Lord has for you in your new year with patience and grace. All right, everyone, get your calendars out. Today at 1.30 p.m., we will go on a virtual trip to Visitors Chapel AME Church of Detroit, where our very own River Lynn Jackson will be the guest preacher for their virtual friends and family day worship service. The meeting ID is 526-557-1073 and the passcode is MyChurch with no spaces and no caps. If you would like to call in, the number is 312-626-6799. Meeting ID 
657-1073 and passcode 7280-0892. For more information, stay for Quinn Cafe after worship. The entire Quinn family is invited and encouraged to bring others onto a visitor Zoom platform. A great time will be had by all. Pastor Lynn will have a Christmas gift drive through giveaway on Sunday, December 19th from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. at the church. Quinn Chapel members can drive through and pick up their special Christmas gifts from Reverend Lynn. Please come through on the McPhail side driveway and exit on the Lippincott driveway. Remember, this is after our worship experience and this is from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Just a reminder, if you were not serving in the office this year, or you have any keys to any part of the church building, filing cabinets, or you have any contracts, paperwork, or meeting minutes, please turn them in to the secretary by December 15th. The Tuesday Men's Bible Study and Wednesday Morning Bible Study will be canceled the weeks of December 20th and December 27th. We will all resume in January 2022. Please, this time with your family and loved ones as we usher in the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Keep your ears open for our combined watch night service. Details will come the closer we are to the event. Lastly, a quick reminder that when you make a local or long distance call, you now must include the area code. To everyone on Facebook, YouTube, and a Zoom. Thank you for joining this morning. If you are visiting with us, drop a heart in the comment section so we can say hello to you. Your presence is felt and we appreciate you joining this morning and this worship experience with us. Stay connected with Quinn Chapel. There's a fresh wind of Quinn, so let's see what God will do through us. Merry Christmas to you all, and remember we are better together. This is Royal Canyon with the morning announcement. Alexis Murphy Morris, and I'll be doing the prayer of invitation. Take me up under your wing, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you promised us that where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. As we stand in awe of your goodness and mercy today, Father, we declare that we love you. Thank you that you have made the way of love known through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you will reveal this great love to all of us today as we gather here for worship. Lead us by your spirit to praise you. May our hearts overflow with thanksgiving and our mouths proclaim your everlasting goodness. Lord, we welcome you amongst us to celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your internal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know of your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. We thank you for how you know each one of us by name and have caused us to walk with you. We say that we are dependent on you and our trust is in you completely. We invite you to be present amongst us as the power of your Holy Spirit. As we surrender ourselves in admiration, we ask that you will come by your Holy Spirit and inspire our hearts today. O oh Lord, our God, you are worthy of all our praise. You are the God who never fails to keep his promise. And we thank you in Jesus' name death and resurrection, we see your love, justice, mercy, provision, and victory. You are the God who lifts up those who are weighed down. You are the God who provides for your children. Our desire is to praise you as long as we live, inhabit our praises as we gather together today. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
shine bright, shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. Verse three. Christ by night is heaven adored. Jesus, the light of the world. Dear Heavenly Father, I praise you and I magnify you right now, for there is none like you in all the heavens and all the earth. Lord, we lift you up, we magnify and we exalt you. Blessed art thou, O Lord, King of the universe, creator of all things. Lord, we decrease right now as you increase. We ask that you show up and show out. We ask that you glorify your name, that your word Come to life right before our eyes by your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. We pray for your anointing and for your presence. Forgive us of all of our sinful thoughts, our sinful words and acts as we forgive those who sin against us. And let nothing keep us from hearing your voice and feeling your presence. And let nothing keep us from being at your feet and at your throne and drawing near to you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. We ask that you have your way right now, Lord. Satan, the Lord rebuke you and the blood of Jesus is against you. We bind Satan and demonic forces right now and give no place to the enemy. And we plead the blood of Jesus against all the hurt and danger that Satan is trying to bring into our lives right now. Lord, we lift you up. We magnify and we thank you for your word, for your salvation, for our redemption. We thank you right now, Lord. And we bless your name both now and forevermore. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, and might. And I love my neighbor as myself. I say unto one and all, praise the Lord. To Pastor Lynn, to the members of this church, to the elders, the ministers, to my wife and kids, I say unto one and all, praise the Lord. Y'all know how I get down. I must give God the glory. Every time I speak, I must give God the glory and exalt him because he is worthy. And I confess that 
we serve a mighty God, the one true living God. And he is awesome. The Lord Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, preached the kingdom of heaven, his kingdom died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. And on the third day rose again from the dead with all power, glory, and authority in his hands. I confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The Almighty God manifests in the flesh. The Word of God made flesh the authority and right hand of God. I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He rules and he reigns forever. He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one true living God, the most high God. The King of glory and Lord of hosts, the King of kings, the Lord of lords and the God of gods. He is holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. He is the Ancient of Days, and his existence is from time everlasting to time everlasting. From the rising of the sun to the going down the same, he is God. And I bless his name both now and forevermore. Well, God is good all the time. And I praise and I magnify him. And I am thankful for this opportunity to decrease and speak the word of truth, which is the word of God. For the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So the word of God is truth. The word of God is life. The word of God is the way to God's kingdom, to be in his presence at, and at his feet and at his throne forever. Well, I was before the Lord as he gave me this word, as I was meditating and praying. And it, it, it 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 hit me in a way that it to took me totally by surprise. And the reason why it took me by surprise, not so much because I wasn't familiar with what was uh what he was showing me, but simply it took me by surprise by the way he showed it to me. We live in a society now where so many people are really you know, really trying to have their moment in a spotlight, their moment of fame, their moment of recognition, their moment of glory. Um, and if they don't get that, they feel that they're being robbed or they, that they're being held back or being kept from something. And so many times when people get converted, and become Christians or become children of God and servants of the most high God. They go through their journey. They go through their walk, maybe even a ministry where they are watching other people be blessed, where they are watching or simply doing the will of God. And they feel as though things aren't going their way. They feel as if um, this journey or this walk is not turning out to be all that it was cracked up to be that so many people had promised them and told them that if you get saved and become a Christian, you know, your life is going to be so much better. You know, you're going to have that house, that spouse, you're going to have that car, that job, that promotion, you know, your financial blessings, you know, your, your health. And for some people, it happens right away. For others, it may take years before they see their breakthrough, their blessing, maybe even their deliverance. And so a lot of times we have a tendency that when it doesn't happen, when we want it to happen or the way we thought that it was going to happen, our breakthrough, our blessings, um, our sp even our spiritual growth. Sometimes our flesh gets us in a, a, a carnal state of mind or a uh, murmuring and complaining um, position and we start looking internally, feeling like we've been robbed by God. Not, not us robbing God, but God robbing us. Robbing us from a, a life of happiness. Robbing us from a life of pleasure. Robbing us from a life of things that we deem to be um, financial status or um, living a good life or a good quality of life. And so today's particular message... Um, as you can see by the title, um, is simply the question that we ask God or we ask ourselves as we look and see the parade go by, or so we think. And that question is, what about me? When is it my turn? What about me? When do I get my break? What about me? When, is I, when do I get my shot? What about me? 
When do I get my blessing? What about me? When do I get my healing, my breakthrough, my deliverance? Whatever it is you're looking for, Lord, what about me? Now, for some of you, you've already got your answer and you've gotten whatever it was you were looking for from God. All right. For others, this question is still hanging and dangling over their heads. But I want to let you know today, and I want to encourage you in the name of Jesus, God has not forgotten about you. And we have to first understand that knowing that God hasn't forgotten about you, that maybe, just maybe, what it is that you're going through or what it is that you're waiting on isn't so much that you're waiting on God, but God is waiting on you. I'll say that again, flat footed. It's not so much that you're waiting on God to answer your prayer, your breakthrough, your blessing, your marriage, your spouse, your house, whatever it is you're looking for. Maybe, it just maybe, God is waiting on you. And let's take a look in the word as we make it perfectly clear why we can say God is waiting on you or waiting on us. All right. Let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And we're going to start there. And the Lord Jesus is talking to the disciples. He's doing his ministry. He's doing his thing. He's doing signs and wonders and miracles. He's revealing himself to the disciples. He's revealing himself. He's proclaimed to be the son of God. He's teaching the kingdom of heaven. He's preaching the gospel. And then all of a sudden he hits them with this standard that God has. This standard that God set. From the beginning of time, from the beginning of man's existence, God has set this standard. And yet still, we overlook this standard thinking that we can somehow get around this standard for our own personal gain. And we were deceived from the beginning. But we'll get to that in a second. Let's go to the scripture first. So the Lord Jesus is talking here in, in Matthew. Uh, we pick it up in chapter 16, uh, verses 24 through 26. And God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus, reveals the following. He says, and I'm coming out of the King James Version. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man, any man, white man, black man, rich man, poor man, tall man, short man, ugly man, wool man, Young man, young woman, all right, any man will come after me, the Lord Jesus. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And we know that when he says, let him take up his cross, or let him deny himself and take up his cross, that means you take, you are literally taking up your burdens. You are literally taking up the things, the cares of this world. You are literally crucifying yourself, sacrificing, okay, to follow God, to live for God, to serve God. You are denying yourself. You are putting yourself on the back burner. Paul said, I die daily. He, the Bible says that he crucifies his flesh, that he dies daily. And no, we're not talking about a physical, literal death. We're talking about dying or denying our flesh, denying ourselves. In the day and age that we live in, the Bible says that in the last days, men shall become lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God. That they will no longer seek the things of God. They will no longer seek to please God. Unthankful, unholy. And the Lord Jesus, who knows everything, who knows the end before the beginning, made that clear and said that in order for you to be, to come to him, to enter into his kingdom, to be of him, to be a child of God, he makes it perfectly clear here in verse 24, starting off. He says, you got to deny yourself. So this is what 
I mean when I say God is waiting on us and we're not waiting on God. God is waiting to answer your prayer because he's waiting for you to deny yourself. You haven't done that yet. You haven't denied yourself. So that's the first point. If you want to know why it is that God has taken so long, ask yourself, have you truly denied yourself? Have you truly picked up your cross? Have you truly forsaken this world and followed the Lord Jesus? His standards, God's standards, God's way, his commandments. That's the first point. It gets better. Verse 25, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. See, we're running around trying to preserve. We are by, by creatures of habit. We are we, we naturally go into a state of mind where we become uh, self-preserve, self-preserve, self-preservation. I mean, we have some people that will sell their own parents, their own children out. They will dime out those, those people under the bus in order to survive or to stay on top or to come out on top. They'll make others look bad to make themselves look good. And I have a saying that I always follow that when one person makes others look bad to make themselves look good, you actually make yourself look worse. And it says right here, according to the Lord Jesus' teaching, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. You got to give it up for the Lord Jesus. You got to give it all up for the Lord Jesus. Okay, you've got to lose yourself, count it all lost, count it all as dung, Paul wrote. If you truly are seeking the Lord, if you really want that prayer answered, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to count it all lost. You've got to lose yourself. Okay, you can't try to be in God, but then you're still trying to hold on to this world. In the book of Genesis, it talks about um the destruction of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and how Lot and his family came out and they were instructed not to look back. And Lot's wife looked back, not just with her eyes, but with her heart. She didn't let go. She did not lose and walk away from and count those things lost. She looked back with her heart and tried to hold on to those things, the pleasure of this world, the sinful man, the sinful nature. But it gets better. Verse 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul, his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? See, when you choose this world over God, you are actually giving up your salvation. The Bible teaches us that he who is friends with the world is at enmity or at war or is against God. That you cannot be friends with this world and still call yourself being in God and of God. I'm sorry. I'm just going put, to put it out as the word has it. Again, we're trying to answer that question. What about me? And in order to answer that question, we have to establish why it is you haven't gotten to where you're trying to get to. Why you haven't gotten that breakthrough. Why you haven't gotten that blessing, that prayer answer. Whatever it is you're looking for from God. We are we going we going to peel back some layers here today in the name of Jesus. So with that, verse 26 opens our eyes to that first layer. For what is a man profited if if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So let's look at that real quick and peel back a layer. And we see In the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, a horrible price that was paid because someone wanted something that was not meant for them to have, but they exchanged their own soul to obtain it. So let's take a look. In the book of Genesis, chapter 3 going to start reading at verse 1. Genesis chapter 3, start reading at verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. 
And we know the serpent was actually being controlled by Lucifer or Satan, who was the first known creature to become corrupt after God created them and turned to his own selfish ways. See, Satan is the epitome. If you go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14, he is the epitome of asking that question, what about me? Because he stood before God, before his throne. And as God was being worshipped, the glory of God shone through him, through Lucifer. And he saw the glory going to God and not to himself. He wasn't able to keep that glory for himself. And so he began to ask that question, what about me? And because he asked that question and he became corrupt in his heart because he wanted that glory for himself, he was casted out and rejected by God out of heaven. And from there, he began to seek out his lifelong ambition to corrupt the creations of God. And so now we see him going on this mission and he starts with Eve in the Garden of Eden and he walks up to her or cross to her, however you want to uh, depict the serpent at the time. All right. And he says, as I go back to uh, ver the second half of verse one, I'll just read the whole thing again. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Okay, now he's actually you know, asking the question, how, how much, you know, have you, have you talked to God? Have you really talked to God? Do you really know the will of God? Do you, well, have you been following the instructions of God? That's the first thing. It's a setup. It's a ploy to, to see how close she is to God or see what she's going to say. Verse two, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Verse three, but the fruit of the tree, which in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it neither shall ye touch it lest ye die and verse 4 now this is the this is the this is the the can the the can of worms open right here and the serpent said unto the woman ye shall not surely die strike 1 strike 2 verse 5 for god doth know that in the day ye eat thereof then your eyes shall be open strike that strike 2 here comes strike three and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. So there's three things that he presented to her right there. First, he said, you can do whatever you want. You're not going to die. You, God made you. You're going to always be you, you, you're eternal. You're always going to be eternal. You're always going to be eternal. So that's the first deception he put out. Second deception. He says, God knows. Okay. That if you if you take of this tree, your eyes are going to be open. God knows. And therefore, God is holding back from you information. God is holding back from you knowledge. God is holding back from you something good. You see, the enemy is quick to let us think or deceive us into believing that when God tells us no, that we are being withheld from something good, something pleasurable. When God tells us not to sin. The enemy is quick to come and say, see, God don't want you to have any fun. God don't want you to have a life. And somewhere in translation, the enemy has made us believe because he is a liar. John chapter eight, verse 44. He's the father of lies. The devil is a liar. He got us to believe that the definition, the definition of having a life or having a good life is a life of sin. OK, a good life or a real life or having a pleasurable life, or having fun, is a life of sin. And if you ain't allowed to sin, you're not having fun. If you're not allowed to sin, you're not having a life. If you're not allowed to sin, you don't, you're, you're, you're just wasting time. So here is where we must open our eyes and realize, first of all, that when God sets a standard in an order, and we begin to question that standard in order, thinking that, we're being kept from something good. When God says no, you should automatically have a red flag go up and realize that that is a temptation of deception. That you're being tempted by the enemy 
to be deceived and misled away from God, God's orders, God's standards and God's commandments. So let's keep going. So let's go to that third part. All right. It says the eyes shall be opened, and then the third part and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. Remember, Lucifer fell when he wanted to be like God, like the most high. Not only that, he wanted to bump God off his throne and take over in reference to Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28. OK, so he put that same corruptible thought into the mind of Eve and tells her what? If you take of this tree, you'll be just like God. Knowing good and evil. So he put that same corruption into her heart and deceived her. You see, we were already made in the image of likeness of God. We are already like God when he made Adam and Eve before the corruption and before the fall. Okay. They were perfect. They were eternal. They were going to live forever. They, they felt no pain. They weren't going to grow, uh, grow of old age or have any sickness or so on and so forth. But he came to make and made them think or made Eve believe or deceived Eve into thinking that she was being kept from something, being kept from being a God. And it is a lie from the pits of hell. I'm here to tell you right now, when God made you, he broke the mold. When God made you, he established you to be before him forever. And the enemy comes and corrupts that. It makes you feel that you are less than what God has made you because you're not doing what it is that the enemy declares to be a good thing or the enemy declares to be something that you're missing or being um, kept from. All right. So let's look at verse six. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. All right. There wasn't nothing wrong with it. Look, it was appetizing. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. All right. Something that looked like it, it like she's going to have a good time tearing this up and eating it. Now, here's the most dangerous part and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Now she has asked that question herself. What about me? She has now asked that question herself. What about me? There's something there's something to gain by taking of this uh, fruit. There's something to gain. I There's something that I can have, something that I can obtain, something that I can gain and get by taking of it. So she asked that question at that moment. What about me? All right. She took of the fruit of thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So you see, this is the birth of what about me? The birth of, uh, of, of, of being disobedient, the birth of doing it your way and not God's way. And they failed miserably. So we must come to the realization that when we start asking, what about me? We need, we need to, the Bible says, examine ourselves and realize that it's not about us. It's about God. It's about God's will, God's way, God's standards. And we can never challenge or dispute or go against it because God knows what he's doing. Come on, somebody. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. So let's look at some key points and understand that it's not about us. It's about God. All right. First of all, understanding that it's not about us, it's about God. We got to go to the book of Colossians, the book of Colossians, chapter one. And I'm going to read this real quick and I'm almost done because this is going to peel back our next layer. Understanding why it's not about us, why we we don't ask what about me. But this puts us in a perspective to understand that it's not about us and it never will be. I'm, this is a spoiler alert. For those who, who are waiting, it's, it will never be about us. It will always be about God. It will always be about the Lord Jesus. In the book of Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, who hath made delivered us, who hath delivered us, 
from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, in whom we have redemption through his blood. This is where it goes back to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. Here is the gift. It's by the blood of Jesus. Even the forgiveness of sin, the price he paid on the cross. Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God? The Lord Jesus, God manifested in the flesh, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created. Check us out. For by him, he made it, he did it, God did it. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. And watch this. This is, a, this is, why, let, this is why we stand on. It's not about us. It's about the Lord Jesus. All things were created by him and for him and for him. It's all about the Lord Jesus. It's all about God. They were made by him and they were made for him. Verse 17, and he is before all things. He comes first and by him, all things consist. Consist meaning all things are held together. He holds everything together. He's the restrainer. He holds everything together. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. In the book of Revelation chapter one, as he reveals himself, to John, he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I am he who, who is and was and which is to come. I am he that is alive and was dead and is alive forevermore. Amen. To hold the keys of hell and death. He is the author and the fisher of our faith. He is the first and the last. Bless his name forever. Okay. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. The fullness of the Godhead, the fullness of all things is in the Lord Jesus. That's why it's not a shameful thing. Don't be ever be ashamed to call the Lord Jesus God because he is God. Bless his name forever. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. By him to reconcile all things unto himself, bringing it back unto himself. Everything that he sent out and created, he's bringing it back to himself. That includes you and I. By him, I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. It's all about the Lord Jesus. When you get into a place where you start saying, what about me? You are being misled. You are being deceived and you are putting yourself before God. And I'm here to tell you today, you put God first, keep God first, and then God will bless. Where is he? What is he talking about? Where is he coming from with that? I'll tell you right now. I'm glad you asked. In the book of Matthew, chapter six, verse 33, he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What God considers to be right, what God's God's standards. Okay. And all things shall be added unto you. See, when you put God first, when you seek his first, when you seek him first, when you seek his kingdom, his righteousness, his standards, then he says he will give you that life and that more abundantly. Then when you deny yourself, he said you will receive a life, not only a life to, that is to come, but you will see, receive blessings and a hundredfold in this lifetime as well. See, that is the secret to getting yours. That is the secret to getting your breakthrough. That is the secret to getting your blessing is when you put God first. So what about me? The answer is this. You put God first and God will take care of you. You seek God's face and God will take care of you. 
You please God and God will take care of you. I said, please God. What about this pleasing God? Let's go ahead and take a look at that real quick. You've got to learn how to please God because that's how you put God first when you please God. So let's look at some examples of that real quick. And we're going we're gonna to close this up. You got to learn how to please God. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, starting at verse 5, it says, By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found. He was taken. This is considered the first rapture. Because God had translated him for before his translation, going from this realm to God's realm, from natural to spiritual, from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal. He had this testimony that he pleased God. What about you? It's about God. How do you, how do you get yours? You please God. Verse six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Check this out now. It's not just about having a happy, happy thought. Let's look at it even further. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. Here you go. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, God is not just looking for you to believe on him and then you go on with your life and go on in the world. God is looking for you to get with him. God is looking for you to seek him, seek his face, seek him out, look for him. All right. You've got to please God. You please God with your faith and you please God by seeking him daily. Last verse and I'm done. I promise. I promise. I promise. But I love the, I love God's word so much. In the book of First Kings, a perfect example, another example of living for God, pleasing God, serving God, is this prayer and this experience that King Solomon had when he first came on the scene as king of Israel. Awesome example. First Kings chapter three. And I'm just going to read through it and I'm done. Starting at verse three. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David, his father. Only he sacrificed and burned incense in high places. And the king went, verse four, and the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. Verse 5, in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. The Lord came to Solomon, King Solomon. And God said, ask what I shall give thee. He said, okay, what is it that you want? You're the son of, you're the son of David. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bless you. What is it that you want? Now, this is the perfect time for King Solomon to say, well, it, it, I'm going to make it about me. But let's see what he does. And Solomon said, verse 6, and Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Verse seven. And now, O Lord, my God. Thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. He didn't try to boast of himself. He didn't try to make it seem like he got this thing all figured out. He knew the burden of being a king. As the saying goes, heavy is the head that wears a crown. Solomon knew what he was up against. Verse eight, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Verse nine, give therefore, watch this, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this thy so great a people. Verse 10, and the speech pleased 
The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. See, Solomon didn't make it about himself. He made it about God. He made it about God's people. He made it about serving and pleasing God. Verse 11, And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. He said, You didn't make it about you. You made it about me, about pleasing me, about serving me, about doing my will, about taking care of my people. Verse 12, Behold, I have done according to thy world, thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise unto thee. He said, I'm going to bless you and do for you what I will, what I've never done before with to any, any servant before you or after you. I'm about to bless you in a way that no one else will ever be blessed um, again before or after you. Verse 13, And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked. What does the word say? He shall, he shall give you a, um, above, um, above and beyond all that you could ask or think. Thank you, Jesus. Both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou will walk in my ways, here's the condition for those who think it's just about getting your blessing and taking the money and run. And if thou will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then will, then I will lengthen thy days. If you have a heart for God and you have a made up mind that when you want to be in God, You've got to put God first. You can't have the mind of what about me and me, 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 when God is saying, no, it's not about you and it never will be. It's all about God. It will always be about God. It is all about his glory, his purpose, his standards, his kingdom, his righteousness. And when you learn to put God first, then your breakthrough will come. When you learn to put God first, then your prayer will be answered. When you put God first, then your healing, your deliverance, your spouse, your house, your promotion, your job, whatever it is that you're looking for. When you put God first and you make it about him and not about yourself. God is so awesome. I thank God that he has learnt, taught me and has put me on that path to put him first, to deny myself. To say, Lord, what must I do to please you? How can I give you the glory today to be able to make sure that you are lifted up, that you are magnified, that you are exalted? That as I decrease, you are increased. To let my life so shine, to proclaim you before men that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God is still on the throne, that God is in the saving business, that God died for our sins, that God loves us because it's not about me. It's all about him. Today, I pray that you lift him up. Today, I pray you examine yourself and realize that God, I want to make you first in my life. I thought I was making you first, but I realized internally, I realized I was making myself first and I want to do better by you. I want to please you. I want to put you first. I want to put your kingdom first. I want to draw near to you and do your will, deny myself, pick up my cross and follow you to give up these things of this life and of this world to gain everything that you have for me. And you will be surprised what God has for you when you make it about him and not about yourself. We thank God for his word. I thank God so much. And I pray that you receive this with edification, with understanding. And that God will bless you tremendously for putting him first and making it about him and not about you. 
What about me? Mm -mm. It's about him. It's about God. God bless you. I thank God for his word truly, and I pray that each and every one of you received it with gladness and with good tidings. Um, I know it's difficult, I know it's hard sometimes to understand what God is asking of us when we come to him for salvation, when we come to him and make him the Lord of our lives. And we have to come to that understanding that really it is about him. It's always been about him. He says he is God and there is no other. There is no other savior. There is no other God. There is no one he shares his glory with. Okay. He, it, it's all about him. He says, I am a jealous God. He said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. All right. And he means just that. That includes yourself. You've got to put God first. And so today, I would just want to encourage you. Seek the Lord with all your heart. Put him first. Let him be the first in your life before yourself and before anyone. Now, I'm talking about anyone, family, friends, job, anyone. Trust in the Lord. Put him first. Seek what he wants you to do. His will, his way, his standards, his commandments. And don't be ashamed. Heavenly Father, I pray to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for everyone and anyone who hears this message that they learn to submit and surrender to you, to put you first, Lord God, to truly make you the Lord of their life. That you bless them, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that when they put you first, seek you first, and please you, Lord God, that you bless them to be able to receive a hundredfold as you promised in this lifetime and in the life to come because you, they put you first, Lord. Lord, I pray right now that you bless them and fulfill the plan of salvation in each of their lives to be able to know you truly and to worship you in spirit and in truth to dedicate their lives to you and for some rededicating their lives and to truly be with you and put you first Lord God and making it all about you Lord I pray that you bless them right now and be glorified in their lives and we thank you Lord and we bless your name both now and forever it's in Jesus name we pray Amen Put God first and watch him work. Thank you, Jesus. your hand, shout a hallelujah, or watch in amazement what God was showing you. Something about the message caught your attention, and maybe it got you to thinking about some things. All those incidents were God speaking to you. He's always communicating with us in so many ways. That's because he really loves us. Now let's take our praise to another level by worshiping God through giving. Let me explain. When we give our first and best offering to the Lord, we set in motion his plan of sowing and reaping. That's right, God has a plan. The scripture says, that which you sow, you shall reap. He created the system and he will honor his word. The best part about it, you can't be God given no matter how you try. The Lord just loves to give and he gives in so many awesome ways. Now, if this ministry has been a blessing to you today, consider partnering with us as we take the good news of Jesus Christ all around the virtual world. Place God first today as you seek him and what you should sow. Let me tell you the ways you can sow your seed. You can sow your seed through Cash App, Giveify, or Pushpay. 
You can also scan the QR code whenever you see it. Or you can mail in your seed to Quinn Chapel AME Church, 2101 Lippincott Boulevard, Flint, Michigan, 48503. God bless you. I pray this word is a blessing to each and every one of you. I pray that you are edified. I pray that you walk away with something encouraging, edifying, something that will draw you near and go higher in God as you humble yourself before the Lord. May he keep you. May he preserve you for his day, for his coming, for the day of redemption. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and ever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.